Okay. Hi again, everyone. And uh, let's get started here. Sorry to drag you away from that great music, but uh, uh, we'll get underway. I'm Don Goodyear, a member of the Laternal Steering Committee and General Manager of Integrated Watershed Management here at uh, Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. And on behalf of the Committee, uh, Conservation Ontario and the University of Guelph, I'd like to welcome you to this kickoff of the Laternal webinar series. I'd like to also begin uh, by acknowledging that where I am located in, in uh, Newmarket, um, the land we know as the Lake Simcoe Watershed, is the traditional territory of many nations of Indigenous peoples. This land is part of the Williams Treaties, and we are grateful to these nations for the opportunity to settle here and share the land. We also thank all generations of Indigenous peoples, past and present, for their enduring and unwavering care for this land and water. I would also like to acknowledge that you're joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge that traditional owners and caretakers and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. And now I'll take a, a moment to introduce Bonnie Fox, the Director of Policy and Planning at Conservation Ontario. Um, she's been with Conservation Ontario for 24 years, leading and coordinating policy positions to influence and respond to provincial and federal legislative and policy initiatives. Bonnie has been Conservation Ontario's representative representative on the Great Lakes Executive Committee under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement since, since its inception in 2013 and was appointed to the Water Quality Board of the International Joint Commission in 2022. She'll be moderating, moderating today's webinar and with, uh, with that I'll pass it over to you. Take it away Bonnie. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you Don for the introduction. I'm excited the Laternal Committee selected the this topic, Navigating Adaptation to Coastal Hazards, to share with all of you. Uh, 24 conservation authorities have Great Lakes Coast as part of their jurisdiction. Uh, in Ontario, we have a legacy of settlement on our Great Lakes Coasts, and it's only been the last 15 years that all conservation authorities have responsibility to regulate development in this area. Some have been regulating longer. Uh, the risks are changing, flood levels are higher, erosion rates are faster, and we need to understand coastal sediment movement to properly define the dynamic beach. In the meantime, we are dealing with impacts to people's homes, impacts to municipal infrastructure, and degradation of natural coastal systems. The climate change adaptation challenge and the approaches to building community buy-in are varied. I've uh, invited three Conservation Authority leaders, one from each of Great Lakes, Huron, Erie, and Ontario, to share their ideas, successes, and challenges in blending their most recent science to inform public dialogue and local decision-making. I want to thank each of the speakers for taking the time to be with us today and sharing their approaches. Uh, for this morning's webinar, we'll be providing a brief opportunity for you to ask questions after each presentation that are specific to that presentation. And then following the three presentations, we will open it up for any questions through the uh, Q&A box. So a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first, all of our attendees are muted and you will not be able to speak or come on video. Uh, you will find a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. At any time during the webinar, I encourage you to type your questions in the box and press enter to have it posted. You may direct questions to uh, um, at individual presenters or as a whole. Uh, you can upvote a question you like by pressing the thumbs up. Feel free to interact with others in the webinar through the chat box. And to our speakers, a reminder to use your mute button when you are not speaking and of course to unmute yourself when you are. Uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded so that others who are not able to attend will be able to listen in when they can. And now maybe we could review the opening poll results before. Yeah, so we've got 37% uh, from GTA, 11% from Eastern Ontario, 9% Central. A little bit from everywhere. Um, uh, affiliation, 68% Conservation Authority, 3% uh, Municipal, We've got some federal and provincial ministries in as well, a nice range, no students, um, some consultants, others. And, um, and then uh, which Great Lakes Coast impacts you the most? 49% Lake Ontario, 20% Lake Huron, 
13% Lake Erie, 1% Lake Superior, and all of the above uh, is 17%. So thank you for participating in our poll. And there we go. Um, so I will introduce our first speaker is Patrick H Huber. Kidby from Maitland Valley Conservation on the Lake Huron coast. For the past five years, Patrick has worked in the Flood and Erosion Safety Services Department. In his current role, he supervises staff and coordinates the administration of the Section 28 regulation and natural hazard planning responsibilities. Patrick is also the backup communications lead for flood emergencies and participates as a duty officer on weekends and holidays to monitor for possible storm events that could result in flooding. He participates in conservation authority discussion groups related to land use planning, regulations activities, and the conservation authority coastal working group to name a few. Uh, since 2020, he has been involved in updating coastal hazard mapping within Maitland Valley Conservation's jurisdiction and more recent efforts co-developing coast coastal resilience strategies with shoreline stakeholders. So welcome Patrick and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Bonnie. Good morning to everyone. 68% uh, Conservation Authority folks out there, so lots of you will be able to sympathize. Um, all right, let's see if I can execute the dreaded share screen here. Now, I wonder if Bonnie or Don, you could give me a thumbs up, just make sure that's, you're seeing the full screen. You're good, Patrick. Perfect, thank you very much. All right, so, well, at, uh, at Maitland Valley there, I have a, a friend of mine, Ben, who most of the time gets to do lots of fun stewardship work and get people grants and, and feel good stuff like that. Um, but he did a, a, be, a brief stint in planning and regs and, and kind of got a feel for that that can be a thankless job sometimes. And he came up with this idea while he was doing that of that in planning and regs, we're not dream crushers, we're dream adjusters. I really liked that and I thought about it ever since. And with this community coordinated shoreline hazards um, updates that we did, uh, it's requiring a lot of a lot of dream adjustments. Uh, it's a big adjustment for lots of sections of our lake shore. But despite that, it's being very well received. Um, and so I'd like to talk about kind of what we have, what we needed, how we got there, what we've been doing, um, but also talk about why I think that's being so well received by our communities. So this is a really quick overview of just what we've been doing. And doing it's you know, three years of work uh, that's being, with the help of some federal funding extended into five years of work. Uh, the bulk of it thus far has been uh, the work that Bonnie alluded to there, updating the shoreline hazards, uh, but we've also been able to push that into a lot of communication and development work with our shoreline communities uh, that's going over the next couple of years. This is where we are, uh, Maitland Valley Watershed. It's 50 kilometers of shoreline on the Lake Huron coast, uh, including three very, uh, very engaged and active and supportive municipalities that we're very lucky to have, um, Ashfield, Colborne, Wawanosh, the town of Godrich, and the municipality of Central Huron. And in February 2021, with our uh, meetings with them, telling them that we really needed uh, an update for the shoreline hazards based on what we were seeing, we got unanimous thumbs up and uh, so we're very really blessed to have the support of municipalities that we do uh, and this is what we told them that we needed uh, you're not meant to read all this and, and most of you will know but the shoreline hazards are made up of three things really a flooding hazard an erosion hazard and a dynamic beach hazard and so these three things are what we sought to uh, update. And what we do with those is to determine setbacks, um, how redevelopment is handled, 
screening for where geotechnical engineering might be required and flag really unstable structures. And a few years ago, actually started sending out letters requesting that people move back because of how unstable it, it appeared that their properties were becoming. And uh, we needed that because quite simply, what we had was not remotely good enough. Uh, that 50 kilometer stretch of the Lake Huron shoreline there, in short, more of it was now water and less of it was land. So this just shows you this red line here, that even without getting any new data um, or any new um, hazard data, just new topography, the historic 100 year lake level plus that 15 meter uprush, even just overlaying that on the new topography we had after the high lake levels several years ago, moves that flood hazard in you know, another 15 meters in a lot of places. So just grossly out of date. Very similarly with our land, um, it really has moved in quite substantially and it creates this ground zero for needing to measure everything again, the erosion allowance, that stable slope going up at a three to one, it's a blank slate almost for, for where those hazards are because everything has a new starting point for where it's measured from. And this is the most important part. It's something that we're very fortunate to have been able to sort of push ahead further than than uh, really anyone else has at this point and it's getting a lot of traction um, but again it is the most important part and that is just climate change it's i feel like in conservation authority conversations it's probably said you know at least once a paragraph but it's critical and it was very important to us and our municipalities that it was in this mapping in a tangible way that we were actually preparing for what these impacts are going to be The first portion of viewing that was looking at the trends just in the Lake Huron level on those peaks. So the median trend is going up, um, but what we used for those peak instantaneous levels. So you, know, you see the peaks in the 80s, the peaks we had just a couple of years ago, and those are increasing. If you look at the past 100 years, those highs are getting higher. And so we have incorporated that into the static lake level. Another major component of that, um, and this slide will become important, so maybe just look at it twice. Um, another big part of that, uh, relating mostly to erosion, was the changes in lake cover. So what you see here on the left is the 10 years leading up to the 86 records. And then on the right side, you see the 10 years leading up to the 2020 records. And very clearly you can see, we used to have more ice. And when you factor in a lack of ice, so in this particular case, what it is is a hind cast of storms we actually got, you see more wave energy hitting the shoreline. So every pink bar there is exceeding every blue bar. And that is an expression showing that there's more of the lake, more energy, more erosive capacity hitting the lake every single time we don't have ice compared to what we do. And the not having ice is getting a lot more common. So the community coordination aspect of that and what I just talked about really was in a nutshell, the bulk of what we've been talking to our communities about. Um, and a lot of it is is comparable to the way we presented it to them. And these are instances of, of when we have had those presentations and discussions and, and trying to illuminate this data and these trends for them. And this isn't, you know, thousands of hits on our websites or Twitter, now X, I guess, um, responses, Facebook posts, none of that. These are all just meetings where we were actually there to speak to people either through a screen or, or properly face-to-face. -face. But these are all individual instances of when we made the effort to get out and have actual conversations going two ways. 
Uh, and with the second part of our, our project, these co-developing coastal resilience strategies that um, Bonnie mentioned there, we've tried to get beyond the just municipal and cottager story, because those are really the two main groups that that the bulk of the communication strategies are kind of geared towards. Um, and they're obviously hugely important groups. It's why they're the main two in these stories. But we tried to get outside that and tried to get beyond um, and accumulated a stakeholder group with 152 distinct contact contacts across 17 you know, different groups, including some less common ones like youth and education, agriculture, uh, real estate, you know, the contractors and developers looking at the shoreline with an eye to building. Um, and again, just really making a concerted effort to get beyond what that usually sort of narrow scope is. And they're talking uh, pleasantly often about us. And I just wanted to share this quote. I thought it was really great as a recent request we had to uh, speak more about this information, that information I just presented to one of our cottage associations. Um, I think MVCA study is wonderful. It is not the happiest message to hear, but it is a very proactive, forward-looking attempt to get ahead of a problem dear to our hearts here at the beach and a very important message. And I wouldn't disagree. So why are we getting those kind of emails, those requests? You know, where are the, the torches and pitchforks that seem to so commonly accompany mapping updates for conservation authorities? I have a few ideas about that. Um, and the first one boils down to making it clear. So you saw this earlier in the presentation and it's a very discreet graphic, not with a lot of numbers on it because it really doesn't need a lot of numbers. It's just to say, we have measured that change in land and there it is. It's really clear, simple stuff, not with a lot of bells and whistles. And that making it clear helps to make it real. So this is an oblique um, picture of that same section of shore. It's what people are seeing. And even if they're not on, you know, the beach or the bluffs seeing this firsthand, which a lot of them are, we can show them pictures like this to say, oh yeah, I can, from this angle, I really get that that land is, is way in there, that that is a drop off. You can see little sheds and decks falling in. So it helps to ground what people are seeing as, oh, a, a real thing, not just something on a, a top-down map. Now, I can hear the eyebrows knitting together asking, make it clear, by what crazy definition is this clear? But this is that ice cover um, slide I asked you to look at twice before. And when I'm not adjusting dreams, I do a lot of uh, sketching and, and painting and, and artsy things like that. And through that, I've gotten to grips with some really interesting things that the human eye does. And one of those things is assess shapes quite well and, and making some basic comparisons, big or smaller. And without any detail on this slide, it's intuitive to see those shapes, the one on the left representing ice cover in the 80s, the one on the right representing ice cover in the 2010s. It's, it's almost instant, that intuitive, oh yeah, I see more on the left. I see more ice in the 80s. And that connection, even if the person isn't really conscious of it, they make it immediately and it helps to tell this story. And it helps to make it real again. Um, another one of those oblique shots showing uh, what should be a ton of ice in January. I have a, a distinct memory of uh, snowshoeing out like a kilometer out onto to Lake Huron in, I think it was, it was January or February, but I haven't heard of that in years, um, anyone being able to do that. And so this is really what, what people are seeing and having seen that measured, that ice cover, that distance in land, seeing it in a way that's presented as data, but also as a way that's presented just as people are seeing it really helps to make it real. This is another visual that was uh, developed by our, our fantastic consultants who worked on this project. Um, and 
again, it's it's fairly simple. It's you know a red line in there representing the erosion hazard. Big blue polygon. That's yep. That's where the the lake is. That's where it's flooding, and it's really easy to get a grip on this as it moves. You're able to get a sense of where these things really lay on the land. We won't go through the whole thing, but um, again, I found this a, to be a really great visual for making the extent of these hazards clear to people. This is just a still image of that um, that same video, and I wanted to point out just right there in the center of the screen, kind of to the left of the play arrow, there's a building at the bottom of the bluff, and you'll see a road in behind it that's inundated. You can quite clearly see that, oh, there's water back there on that road. And once again, that's made very real. Uh, this faded yellow line you can see in that picture is the median line of that road. And this is a storm, in fact, that we weren't supposed to see kind of in our current conditions, but is a storm that is generated or an inundation that's generated by incorporating climate change. But it's things we're already seeing. And again, folks who didn't go down on, on November 1st, the morning after Halloween, to see the flooding that we had like this in two consecutive years, we can show them these pictures and we can talk about you know, the, the cement transformer platform that's just to the right of this down by the water treatment center that was, you know, the water was about an inch below pedestal for that transformer. Um, it's it's a real thing that's occurred for this town and is, represents a, a real hazard. And so, again, beyond just why it is making sense to people, why is it working? Why is it generating good discussions? And why are people asking us to talk to them more about it, not just going, eh, forget these guys, this sucks. And a lot of it, that positivity, I think, comes down to asking questions. This is one of the questions we ask, um, and a pretty vital one, and something we honestly wanted to get a sense of from the community uh, to understand their values. So we got a lot of uh, answers good answers, answers we were expecting, the natural landscapes, the beach, the sort of swimming, recreating, and, and almost spiritual element of, of the lakeshore, um, happy hour, because that's something very valuable about our shoreline too. And as being there to, to talk and to listen and to ask those questions, and I've highlighted the July 2023 meeting we had and I've highlighted that in particular because it was a day where our staff and our consultants were there to almost do nothing but listen. We gave kind of 10 minutes of information at the forefront and then just listened. We asked those questions and wanted to get the answer. And it resonates strongly with people when you can show yourself as somebody there to listen and has a genuine interest in what they want to say, not checking a box or passing the time, but wanting to hear what they have to say. And lastly, I think that it's being received well, and I think our efforts so far have been very rewarding. And, you know, we have those supportive municipalities and the opportunity for funding because there's some good productive forward movement to this. And a lot of that has to do with not just saying, oh, well, sorry, this really sucks. Everything's getting worse. There's less land. You're more in danger. The flood impacts are getting worse. Yeah, sorry. Like, it's it's not just a shrug of the shoulders, but we're trying to get out and give the community something to digest, a way to see potential futures and develop something that is ultimately more resilient. But without having ideas or guideposts or strategies to sink your teeth into as a community you're sort of stuck going well i guess it's accurate information but it's also terrible information what do we do with that so giving people an idea of what they can do with it is hugely important and i think again a reason why we have been asked to continue to do this work and to continue to talk to the community and to just keep listening, we have uh, an open Microsoft form on our website that is 
there's no end date on it. It's the uh, set of four questions, one of which was the, what do you value about the Lake Huron shoreline? But it's just there, it's open. At any point, anybody wants to tell us what they think about this, what they value, it's open there for them to tell us. And we want to hear that at whatever point, because we really want to make it clear that we are there to listen and have these conversations with our community. Uh, now I'll, I'll be quiet and I would be happy very much to listen to any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, uh, very much. And at, at this point in the program, we are opening it up for questions uh, specific to Patrick's uh, presentation. And uh, we have one on the um, in the Q&A with your name on it. And it is, is there a Reader's Digest description of how wave energy is calculated? I haven't seen such a graph and feel that this type of data needs to be shared widely. What an excellent question. I don't have the Reader's Digest description, uh, but I could perhaps get one from, from Seth Logan, who is our, uh, one of our consultants who did most of the work around um, the wave energy and, and built this really amazing, incredibly um, high fidelity model of our shoreline that I could nerd about all day. But the short answer is no, I don't have that definition, but I may be able to get one. Okay. Um, and uh, another question, I'm curious what sort of feedback you got from Indigenous communities in a general sense? Uh, in a general sense, the well, so I'll say first, those conversations are ongoing and there's a meeting I'm hoping to uh, be invited to either this winter or this spring. Um, unfortunately, I think the, the biggest piece of feedback we've gotten is we're so strapped for resources that we don't have a ton of time to talk to you about anything, really. Um, they're really uh, at where we are especially now there's such a request for uh, review of, of projects and proposals and, and lots of folks wanting to engage in that consultation, but the capacity isn't necessarily there. Um, so we're going to keep trying. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> again, I guess I don't have that answer immediately, but uh, we'll hope to be able to respond with what they have to say about the shoreline work uh, this winter, this spring, I'm hoping. Okay, and then uh, it's been pointed out to me, there's a couple of additional questions at the top end here. Um, I was thinking these were for general, but I think we'll just go through them. Uh, what about wildlife functions such as turtle nesting, whose habitat are only in the 30 meter or less setbacks and now under the high water mark? Oh. Interesting question. I actually don't know about a great deal of nesting um, on the lake here on shoreline. Huge caveat here, like I'm no expert at all. Uh, I'm much more familiar with sort of their inland habits, but where we have um, our shoreline, almost all of it is a hundred foot high clay bluff that erodes pretty regularly. So I don't think they spend a huge amount of time um, in around our shoreline as compared to inland lakes and water courses. Thanks, Patrick. And, and that might be a question that we hold on for, for the other panelists at the end as well. Um, and I think that question is more for the end in the interest of time and moving on. I think we will, I'm gonna go to the last question. Did Conservation Authority staff or the consultant lead the engagement consultation process? Did you consult before the study findings and after or just after? Um, so, so, yeah, um, I'd say they're pretty close to, to co-led. Um, the Conservation Authority sort of tried to wrangle uh, various groups together. So the Community Liaison Group and um, uh, the Shoreline Working Group. But I would say they're pretty close to co-led. And, and no, we consulted with um these groups basically from day one before we had any data any mapping to present before we'd done any analysis really we wanted to start that conversation immediately and say this is what we're doing and this is what we're going to want from you and uh, the main thing is the conversation 
We want to start that conversation now and keep it going. Okay. Um, I think with that, there is a, one question still outstanding that I think we'll hold on for the um, for the end of the discussion. And uh, so thank you very much, Patrick, for your presentation. And um, so our next uh, presenter is Mark Peacock from Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority on a long stretch of Lake Erie coast. Mark has been the CAO Secretary Treasurer of the Lower Thames Valley Conservation Authority for the past five and a half years, and he is a registered professional planner. In his career, Mark has provided watershed engineering direction and services to the Ganaraska region, Central Lake Ontario, Kawartha region, Autonomy region, and Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authorities. Mark has been involved in a number of Great Lakes initiatives from being a member of the Lake Huron Conservation Authorities Committee, developing shoreline management plans in Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, to working with the communities of Chatham Kent to address severe lake erosion. Turn, turning it over to you, Mark. Thank you. I will get my presentation up. How's that? You've got it, Mark. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, technical things may be, may be challenging, but the story is still a good story. Um, I want to talk today about a, a, a project called the Rondo Barrier Beach Restoration. And first of all, I'll give you an idea of where we're at. We're in um, Lake Erie at Rondo Bay. I've, I hope you can see my pointer, but you can see Long Point here, uh, Point Peely over here, Windsor on the one end, London over here. So Chatham is in the middle here. And Rondo Bay is just southeast of Chatham, uh, right near, just southeast of the community of, uh, of Blenheim. So this is what Rondo Bay looks like. It's an incredibly uh, rich ecosystem. And um, the community of Erio sits on a, a promontory that comes out towards the, uh, towards the provincial park. And you can see by the lines in the provincial park that it is a, a, a depositional feature that over time sediment uh, de deposited and created this long spit of land that is now the Rondo Provincial Park. We have the community of uh, Shrewsbury and we have communities along the, the shore. Separating Lake Erie from the Rondo Bay is a long barrier beach and, um, uh, and the Erie Harbor. So we'll talk about this. Those are the existing conditions. The, uh, the, the Provincial Park and Rondo Bay are one of the most significant features in the Lower Thames Valley watershed. Uh, the navigation channel provides boating and uh, there is a commercial fishery still in Erio. And there are significant impacts to what's happening to the Bear Beach and the community is concerned. And uh, much of this came um, through discussions of the uh, uh, Chatham Kent Shoreline Management Plan and the, um, and the engagement of community through that. So what's happening over time? What is uh, this uh, uh, line, 1868 line, shows that this big feature was all the way out here in 1868, um, um, uh, and that the pier, the Erio side of the pier, which extends far out in the lake, over time has gathered sediments and, uh, and created far more shoreline and beach features in Erio, whereby the rest of the feature over here was starved of sediment. The, and, and this story, the story of how things have changed is important to how we engage the public. The, it's really important in, in developing um, a project like this, which I'll explain as we go through, and, and I'll also explain how we've been dealing with public and getting public support for this, to be able to have a story that makes sense, that just like um, yeah, the first presentation uh, pre presenter talked about, it's something that they can look out their back uh, window and say, yes, the story that you're saying, I can see and it makes sense. So over time, this barrier beach that you saw was a very thin little uh, uh, um, amount of granulars. What uh, originally was a, a quite a feature. It was really the end of that large peninsula, but it's now got separated. It's a tiny little feature that's left, and the Seagull Island, this feature here, has grown significantly. 
So the formation of the pier and the, the, the second pier out in the lake, it by its definition, has created a new sediment environment. What uh, One of the first things we did was show them the community these types of maps. And we talked about the function, the littoral drift, the, the sediments that move this way from, from the shoreline further to the west, and how they uh, would naturally re regenerate these areas, and how changes to the morphology of the near shore area have, cha uh, have changed that sediment deposition. So we've lost over 240 hectares of, of wetland habitat. Um, uh, the top picture is spotted gar, and my understanding is you can't tell spotted gar, gar by its spots, because long nose gar also has spots. Um, that's a question for our biologists going forward, um, and also fowler toad. So we have some very significant habitat in this area and some significant loss of habitat over time. Here's some historic pictures. And we've used historic pictures um, very, very extensively in talking to the community. A lot of community um, uh, have used this land at one time. It was a big coal uh, area that was for coal for the community of Chatham-Kent got shipped in here from the States, big harbor. You'll notice in the 1940s, that Bear Beach was a significant feature that went all the way over to the lake pier, the lakeside pier of that. And then over, you can see again, a little bit later on, that that same uh, barrier beach um, extending all the way to the to the lakeshore pier. This is what's happening now. We're seeing the barrier beach fall apart, and we're seeing um, the uh, uh, Seagull Island sediments accumulating into the harbor. So we're seeing a very very different and troubling trend. So this is the, the pier, that is the Erio Pier again, sedimentation, and you can even see the sedimentation in the water here as it accumulates behind that pier and the barrier, be, uh, the barrier being broken between the Lake Pier and Seagull Island and the barrier uh, itself being broken in here. What that means is that when we have lake events, the waves from the lakes come right into Rondo Bay, which um, in, for time and memoriam has been protected. So um, areas like Shrewsbury, when we have large storms, now the waves propagate right over the barrier beach through the bay and flood that community. So we are having significant effects, not only on the ecological elements, but on the elements of, of, of human uh, uh, settlement. The added problem with this project, so the project, um, which I'll get to, is about fixing this problem. But one of the Adam, added issues is our two main landowners. One is the province, and the other is the federal government in the small craft harbors. We have got some excellent people from both the province and the, the, uh, the federal government working with us to solve this problem. But it is definitely an added uh, issue once you uh, bring in um, different landowners and their processes when the solution is one solution for both pieces of land. So we developed a project. So we're working towards a solution for this barrier beach and we want to engage our community with uh, knowledge sharing. And the other part is we wanna co-develop a solution and we've been working on that for, for a long time. The, uh, we want nature-based solutions, so we want a solution, a solution that works to the, uh, the reality of how sediment should move or does move, and we want to make sure that those nature-based solutions not only look to the physical, but to the biological processes, not only in Rondo Bay, but on the Lake Erie shoreline. So we want to work with local landowners, and we want to uh, collaboratively identify these solutions. So how do we do this? We invite the community into the process. And I'll go, we've had many, many meetings and the community in many ways has, has become the champion for the project. So we, we, we've been working on plans and we've developed plans with the community um, and we are continuing to develop uh, technical uh, elements to add to those and the understanding. And part of it was um, to make sure the community was with, with us with regards to the need to understand the technical as we develop solutions that made sense.
for protecting their homes and for protecting the ecology. At the same time, we formed what we call the Rondo Berry Beach Navigation and Channel Advisory Committee. It's made up of the municipality of Chatham-Kent, the federal government, the provincial government, and many other organizations that are involved. And um, that, uh, uh, that group was very important in making sure that we had an understanding from all the different people that are engaged in Rondo Bay, and there's a lot of them, um, as we develop processes uh, to come up with solutions. Out of that came a work plan, and uh, it, it, it's an extended work plan. There are uh, um, five phases to it. Uh, and then um, the first phase, one of the most important pieces, the green is we have to do immediately, the red harder to do, um, the blue sort of intermediate. So we've developed work plans, we've worked with the community to, dis to find how we go forward with all these. And number nine, securing a federal and provincial agreement with regards to those lands were absolutely critical because a lot of things couldn't happen without that. So as part of this, we developed a letter writing campaign. So we wrote many, many people uh, regarding this. We had, um, as you can see at the bottom, we've had, in the last couple of years, we've had 15 different meetings. The uh, Erio Community Association actually has my personal phone number. One uh, Tuesday, two weeks ago, I got a phone call while I was barbecuing in my backyard and I uh, um, was put on speakerphone and addressed questions from 50 people regarding this project. Um, that is the type of interaction that we have with different marinas, cottagers association, communities groups um, with regards to this. And as I said before, they are becoming the uh, champion for the project. This is an example of uh, the response that we got from First Nations, from agencies, uh, from different people. Um, one interesting person is the past harbor master um, who really knows uh, all about the operation of that harbor and uh, is a really good resource and it has uh, really come up to, to, to the ground. At the same time, we understand that nature-based climate solutions, and we, we brought uh, climate change into the science of this as well, is something that for lake work, it's really in a, a starting phase. I, I, I see us at the same phase with lake work that we were 25 years ago with the first natural channel type gatherings we had in Niagara Falls with regards to natural channel work and, and stream um, work that we, we now consider pretty, pretty um, set science. But we need to get the science right in the shoreline. We uh, need to understand the bed form, the movement of sediments, how those bed forms respond to what we do. And we are really working hard to understand that. Um, these, this is some of the work that we're doing um, as we're going through the process. We, there is better technology and we are working with both our municipality um, to get equipment such as side scanning, multi-beam um, sonar systems to do a better job of defining these forms that may be uh, places that we, we look for depositional or even for mining for sediments to rebuild this barrier beach. So there's a lot of work going on uh, uh, and we're working with uh, good people in that. Um, Suzak, uh, Pete Suzak and his company are working with us and do, we're doing things such as um, defining how the sed sediments are accumulating due to the shape of those piers. But every step of the way, we're bringing the communities with us. We're showing the science. We're showing the communities what, what we're doing. And they have been part of developing the terms of reference for the work that we're going forward with. So the, um, the Erio Community Association um, is the lead when we go to the politicians. They, um, we've gone to MPPs and MPs. We've gone to, we've uh, prepared briefs for different ministers, um, all with the support of the Community Association. And um, we've got really good response from the province and the federal government working towards getting an agreement to move, to move this project forward. It would not have happened without the community associations and without them knowing in many ways, 
the answers as well as we know the answers. So when you, if you were to go to uh, Erio, I would think that you could ask most people that are engaged in this about the sediment drift along Erio, and they would tell you the same story I'm telling you. So what we want to do in the long term is we want to rebuild that barrier beach um, because of uh, uh, and change uh, change the formation of the sediment that sits in the harbor, move it over into the barrier beach, and then continually use the the dredge eight that is uh, that is har um, harvested from the harbor to continually um, maintain and and revitalize the beach over time. So that's the story of, of a project. It's not we haven't started construction yet. I have a very good um, a feeling about it because we have fully engaged the community. We have a good solutions that uh, uh, are aware of the science behind what is happening out there. And we, uh, in turn, uh, have got a positive response from the people that we need to have that response from. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for, uh, for sharing the Rondo Bay scenario with us. Um, we have a few minutes uh, to take some specific questions directed to Mark. Uh, right now, I'm not seeing any up on the uh, Q&A, but as a reminder for all uh, participants, if you have a question for our presenters, please enter it into the Q&A box. It's accessible in the bottom uh, panel bar. A question um, that someone has already posted resonates with you, hit the thumbs up to help us identify the questions you'd most like posed during the discussion period at the end of this session. So uh, we, we do have a question for you, Mark, and that is, was removing the pier considered? And if so, what are the reasons uh, that that wouldn't be possible? First of all, um, that, uh, that configuration of pier is actually the same configuration on, on almost every harbor in Lake Erie believe it or not, and on the Canadian side, and it is not the configuration on the American side where they, they don't have nearly as many problems as we have. That will take a big step that, um, to significantly change that pier. We have been having those discussions, but it, it is a significant change in, in how uh, the, the harbors um, that were developed along the North shore of Lake Erie would be reconfigured. So it, um, I think it's a pretty significant step. So um, we are working on it, but um, it is, and it has been considered, but it is a big step. Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Um, Mark, how do you go from dredging the artificial change in flows into um, your sediment trap bay to supporting the barrier islands in being barriers? Well, the, the barrier islands, um, in, it, one of the simple um, answers is the barrier islands protect Rondo Bay. So um, in many ways, a solution is needed, even if it's not nature-based, to, to protect and recreate the barrier. Um, what we're arguing is that will not bring back any of those losses of habitat. So um, our, our arguments uh, around moving the barriers uh, uh, into a natural solution is around ecology, around habitat, around, um, um, around the improvement or restoration of the wetlands of Rondo Bay. Um, it, it's relatively straightforward. If that barrier beach isn't there, Shrewsbury floods massively. So um, it, it, it has to happen from that, even if it was not a forward looking solution, from a, a natural hazard perspective, only disaster happens if that barrier beach does not get reinstated. Thank you. Uh, is there an anticipated cost for renourishing the sediment on the beach? We have some, uh, um, uh, we have some costs probably in the order of 10 to 20 million is what we're looking at because of, of all the different elements to it. It's not just the beach, it's all the ecology and everything else that we that we were bringing to the project. Um, but uh, I, the, 
the actual detailed engineering hasn't been completed yet. So those are only estimates. They're between 10 and probably $15 million. A lot of money. Um, next question. Projects that take place in a provincial park are not eligible for funding under some funding programs. Given the zone of impact is within a provincial park, what innovative funding approaches are required to see this project get off the ground? Who would apply, the CA, municipality, or community group? Well, the first point you're 100% right on, and the project will have to be a project of both the province and the federal government, because it's their land. They, there is an option whereby they could assign us to manage the project, but there are some limitations with the funds that we could receive. However, there are other funds that they use, that the province has and the federal government has for things like rebuilding harbors um, that uh, would be potentially available to do this work. So um, it's not an easy project. Uh, the first step is to get that agreement between the province and the federal government so that everybody's on deck with regards to it. But it will be innovative. Uh, it won't be um, the same types of things that a municipality could could apply for. Thanks, Mark. Um, are you seeing some part of the beach sand depositing uh, now that levels have dropped from their highs? Will nature fix itself in the long term? Actually, a uh, really good question. We are seeing some changes. We are seeing some restoration of the barrier naturally, but not enough that um, the situation will change with regards to protecting Shrewsbury and the other communities of Rondo Bay. So, or protect the ecology. We're still seeing massive destruction of the wetland system in Rondo Bay and, and very critical habitat for species at risk. So, so what, what you're looking for is, is more stability in, in the system, given that there's going to be continual changes and we have done the uh, climate change mapping for this area, and that barrier beach has to be significantly more resilient or climate change that basically takes the whole barrier out. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. And uh, final question, uh, what are the impacts to fish and fish habitat and how are they being addressed? So there are two different impacts. There's the impacts in Lake Erie itself and the impacts in the bay. And there has to be two different approaches. There's near shore forms, bed forms, where they're spawning in other types of habitats in Lake Erie. And there are, um, there are wetland type forms of habitats in Rondo Bay. So we are, the next, one of the next steps is to continue the, uh, the work in uh, looking at the biology of those habitats and working towards solutions that retain those habitats with a reconstructed barrier. Or, or improve them actually is more more to the point. And um, I, I, I think there is another question, but I'm thinking that um, uh, it would be a good one for the uh, end of the session discussion. So um, with that, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Um, so our uh, next speaker is Kate Hayes from Credit Valley Conservation on Lake Ontario's coast. Kate Hayes has over 25 years of experience working in the United States and Canada in the environmental field. Her current role with CBC, oh, in her current role with CBC, she oversees ecosystem restoration and landowner engagement initiatives throughout the Credit River watershed. Kate led the development of, of Credit Valley Conservation's Lake Ontario Integrated Shoreline Strategy and supported the implementation of key restoration actions, such as the Jim Tovey Lakeview Conservation Area. Both of these initiatives included comprehensive communications plans and associated tactics. Thank you for joining us today, Kate, and over to you. Thank you very much, Bonnie, and good morning, everyone. Here with me today, but behind the scenes, are Rizwan Haq and Jacob Killis, both of whom are with CBC's Planning and Development Services team. Having heard from Mark and Patrick about their experiences in characterizing hazards and related communications initiatives, I'm very pleased to share CBC's experience in developing a shoreline management plan and related outreach engagement initiatives. 
you'll learn that our shoreline has been the subject of modifications for close to 200 years, so it's now completely altered, bringing it back to a healthier system in the context of a fully developed landscape and a changing climate is, is complicated to say the least. CBC's Lake Ontario Integrated Shoreline Strategy, or LOIS, was initiated in 2009. The study area stretches from the town of Oakville over to Toronto and encompasses much of the city of Mississauga. It extends about two kilometres inland and roughly six kilometres into Lake Ontario. LOIS set out to identify stressors, impacts and effects influencing the shoreline and to recommend related conservation actions. There was also a recognition of the need to ensure full coordination from the basin down to the site-specific level. And uh, seven coastal reaches were identified based not on natural, but on artificial breaks given the altered nature of this shoreline. These reaches were then assessed based on existing information and supplemented through additional work to address identified knowledge gaps. Beyond providing guidance for restoration, development, and land use decisions, LOIS aimed to provide planning and technical advice to the City of Mississauga to assist in the management of sensitive lands, including hazard and natural heritage lands. LOIS generally followed the framework for subwatershed studies with a background review and data gap analysis completed in 2011, including 10 distinct areas of focus. A characterization report that largely addressed identified knowledge gaps was then completed in 2018. And finally, an action plan that sets out priority con conservation actions across the entire study area and by individual coastal reaches is now in place. I mentioned uh, st stressors and impacts. CVC has adapted IUCN threat and impact criteria to create a list of stressors, impacts and effects that are relevant to the credit watershed. These criteria have then been cross-referenced to standardized conservation actions with a view to ensuring that our work responds to stressors and or impacts. The lowest study area is affected by key stressors and impacts, including water quality, climate change, invasive species, and land use changes. The picture on the bottom is a stone hooker ship and stone hooking took place in the port credit area for about hundred years from roughly 1830s to the 1920s. We estimate that about 4 million tons of stone was removed from the nearshore area. This material was used for building houses, roads, etc., and left the nearshore largely devoid of habitat diversity. The removal of the natural armoring of the shoreline directly contributed to exacerbated rates of erosion and is part of the reason that the shoreline is now over 80% armored with engineered structures. Erosion is therefore much less of a direct issue in the lowest study area. However, there are significant issues with sediment deprivation and impacts to coastal processes. As mentioned earlier, a series of knowledge gaps, including consideration of key stressors and impacts were identified through the background review phase of LOIS and updated in the characterization phase based on compiled information. This information was then used to set out a long list of conservation actions in the final report, Living by the Lake Action Plan. Specific to hazards management, LOIS identified and addressed the following knowledge gaps by firstly setting up 13 erosion monitoring stations across the shoreline. Secondly, inventorying and assessing shoreline engineered structures using a series of criteria, including climate change. The thinking was that knowing approximately when these structures are approaching the end of their lifespan would allow for better targeted planning so that they can be replaced with options that maximize the use of nature-based solutions. Finally, hazard mapping was updated to conform to the provincial policy statement. Shoreline hazard mapping was completed in 2005 for a total of 87 reaches. Erosion, flood, and dynamic beach hazard limits were calculated for each reach. But the 2005 report largely focused on recreation, flooding, and erosion, rather more so than natural heritage features. To conform with the PPS, the report was reviewed and an addendum prepared in 2020, including reflecting risks associated with climate change. The consultant recommended that CVC increase the 100-year lake level by at least 0.2 meters to protect development and infrastructure from lake hazards. With a 15-meter regulatory limit added to the governing hazard limit, the consultant stated that this would capture any uncalculated increase to flood hazard limits due to higher water levels. 
You'll recall that the lowest study separated the shoreline into seven distinct coastal reaches. The Living by the Lake Action Plan identified cons conservation actions for each coastal reach. Coastal Reach 1 had a unique opportunity to reuse locally generated fill from Peel Region's infrastructure program and to use the cost recoveries to, to restore the entire coastal reach. The Jim Tovey Lakeview Conservation Area project was initiated in 2011 using an innovative funding formula to use cost savings from local reuse of clean fill generated through Peel Region's infrastructure projects to fund the restoration of all of Coastal Reach 1. The project included the construction of a 1 to 35 scale model of the design that was tested at the National Research Council's Ocean, Coastal and River Engineering Lab in Ottawa. The physical model investigated the interaction of moderate and extreme waves with a proposed headland beach system and studied ways to opti optimize the design of the beach fill and rubble mound structures. This approach led to significant cost savings for the overall project. An important aspect of this approach was to ensure that the habitat features of the project would not be lost due to extreme conditions seen in this part of Lake Ontario. In order to protect the proposed habitat features, we needed to design for extreme hazard conditions, something that is best seen in the following video. So the Jim Tovey Lakeview project is creating a total of 26 hectares of new green space, including one hectare of Cobble Beach that will replace the mostly armored shoreline. Given the extent of alterations to the shoreline along much of Western Lake Ontario, it isn't possible to restore the shoreline to historic conditions. However, the Headland Beach system does recreate, recreate much higher habitat diversity. As mentioned before, these habitat features, particularly the wetland and shoreline features, were all designed to withstand extreme conditions. Infographics summarizing progress for the project are prepared annually and shared with interested groups, including CBC's board of directors. Regular updates are provided to the general public and interested organizations, including through social and mainstream media, tours and presentations. Communications and engagement with key individuals and organizations have been instrumental in both LOIS and the Jim Tovey projects. LOIS represented the first time that CVC had engaged at such a level with the urban community. We did retain an external consultant to assist in the scoping, scoping of the communication strategy. From the outset, the focus was on developing solutions with the community. As you heard from Mark and Patrick, we ask questions, similarly, we ask questions through a combination of workshops with specific interest groups and through door-to-door, in-park and mail-out surveys. 
We use this as a basis to refine our communications tactics. And this was an important value, reminder of the value of, of traditional knowledge. For example, our estimates of stone removed from our shoreline came from interviews with the son of someone who practiced the stone hooking trade. Similar to both Mark and Patrick's initiative, two committees were formed for LOIS, one bringing together technical and agency subject matter experts, and the second bringing together interest groups such as angling, boating, and naturalist groups. As mentioned, tactics were developed based on interviews and surveys and formed the basis for the type and content of related tactics. Not unlike Mark's findings, the survey assisted us in keying in on areas of interest, including physical exercise, water quality, and wildlife. Interestingly, wetlands and fish were identified as being less well understood, and the consultant recommended that we place a lower priority on this in our short-term messaging. Females and youth were identified as priority audiences, and we were able to leverage CBC's own Conservation Youth Corps program to shift the focus to shoreline-related work. We also held several outreach initiatives targeting mothers' groups. Overall, our tactics ranged from participation in in-person events to news releases to boat tours with VIPs to presentations to the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation Band Council. The relationship with the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation is incredibly important to CBC. We continue to hold annual tours for staff at the Jim Tovey Lakeview Conservation Area. As part of the Jim Tovey project, a dozen local photographers have been documenting change over time as this project morphs into a new green space on the shores of Lake Ontario. The morphology photos are exhibited in a space for the general public every couple of years and give a unique perspective of the site as it evolves. Another approach that aided in setting the stage for Lois was a video narrated by Robert Bateman. The video sets the stage for a call to action that was fully set out in the final Living by the Lake Action Plan with a simple message. What the world needs is CPR, raising consciousness and getting people out in nature. What's wrong with the shoreline? Every Everybody says, oh, there's Lake Ontario. Isn't that very nice? It's a beautiful day and it's blue water and there's sailboats out there. So that's all we care about. Uh -uh. Too often people just look beyond the shoreline and they don't notice what's down there at their feet. Since I've been around and paying attention since World War II and the big building boom, it, there's been a great civilization creep moving west, putting in concrete and putting in artificial crushed rocks. Everybody knows that the biodiversity and potential for life is much greater at the interface between different types of habitat. People have been planting alien species, and there's a lot of alien species that have come in by accident, both on dry land and in the water. The famous zebra mussels are one of the worst things that is happening in the aquatic zones of the shorelines. A lot of shorelines, including Lake Ontario shoreline, have marshes as well as beaches, uh, as well as woodland growing right up to the shoreline. And it's a essential place where migrants stop over after they come across the lake when they're coming north in the springtime and they're exhausted. And if these interface areas between the lake and the shore are degraded, then it's going to be disastrous for these exhausted creatures that need to fuel up for continuing the migration. It's time we started paying attention and actually doing something about returning the shoreline to its original beauty. What the world needs now is CPR, conservation, protection, and restoration. It's even more important than people are realizing. We can have a beautiful planet for our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren. All we need is to raise awareness. The most essential first step in helping to protect the environment, such as Lake Ontario shoreline or anything in the environment, is the raising of consciousness. Groups and organizations of smart people, such as the Credit Valley Conservation, can be very, very useful in raising consciousness. We need public involvement. We need lots of people paying attention, speaking to each other, getting together in neighborhoods, getting together at meetings and forums and so on. If just families went out in nature for a couple of hours every weekend, it would be transformative and wonderful for the kids and obviously wonderful for nature and consciousness raising as well. I strongly advocate every single person get out there. A difference will indeed be made.
In summary, the communication strategies for LOIS and the Jim Tovey project aim to create and to foster trust with a focus on CBC's interest in strategic partnerships. Relationship building with other agencies, including local councillors, has also been key to both LOIS and the Jim Tovey project. I wanted to conclude by letting people know about a newly formed community of practice focused on nature-based coastal solutions. The Great Lakes chapter supports the effective use of nature-based solutions to coastal management by promoting the exchange of technical information to practitioners. If you're interested in more information, feel free to reach out to me or other members of the executive committee listed on the webpage. And with that, I'll finish up and thank you. Welcome questions. Thank you, Kate. Um, we had a question early on in your presentation, and that is a question as to whether Credit Valley Conservation is working with the DFO SEMPRA model development for species at risk and indicator species. SEMPRA is C-E-M-P-R-A. It's a pretty uh, specific question, Kate. Yeah, and honestly, it's a question I cannot answer. I'm not familiar with that model. Um, I would be interested in finding out more about it, and I can certainly circle back to some of our um, our sort of ecologists and, and find out whether or not they're familiar with that model, but I'm not personally familiar with the SEMPRA model. We appreciate it being brought to our attention. Okay, thank you. Other questions uh, specific for for Kate, I see maybe this was intended for the chat, but William Barber is asking about a firekeeper. I'm not sure on the context of that. We yeah. do have, we have actually somebody who's just started with CBC, but he's with another group. He's working on the Credit Valley Trail. Uh, he's more Métis background, but he is, he is a firekeeper, but I'm not sure about the context of that question and in, in, in so far as my presentation. Me either. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, so perhaps with that, I'm not seeing any more questions specific for yourself, um, Kate. So I think um, at this point, uh, I will ask all presenters to turn um, to join us. And uh, we're going to um, talk about the questions that maybe apply to, to, to all the speakers. Um, and um, I'll just uh, remind the speakers to unmute yourselves um, uh, before, you, before you speak. Uh, so the, the first question was raised uh, early on in the webinar, and that is, who wants to make a managed shoreline tax incentive similar to uh, the managed forest tax incentive program uh, to really get focused on what's needed here. And I don't know if our speakers are familiar with, with the MIFTIP program. I am um, somewhat familiar with it. Um, I think something like that, uh, just to my mind, would run into the a persistent problem uh, that's at least persistent along our shoreline, which is um, because the scales of the shoreline processes are so relatively large the it's difficult to have an impact on sort of lot by lot scales so if you know you've got five people in a program who are managing their 50 feet of shoreline in in um, a particular way in a beneficial way and they're receiving credit for that like which is, is certainly wonderful um, it's really hard to sort of restore the larger processes that are maybe not uh, at the scale of those five lots, but more of, you know, the 50 lots north and south of them as well. That's a really good point, Patrick. Um, I, I, I would also say that the problems that we're dealing with are bigger than that, I'm afraid. Um, in Chatham Kent, we're, there's large sections of tra Talbot tra Trail, which is the, lar uh, the significant roadway going down the shoreline that are now being abandoned because of it being unsafe. And those, those people that are in those houses basically have no solution over time, um, other than to either move the house or to abandon the house. 
So um, tax incentives really don't make an impact when the when the problem is that big along many of our shoreline. Kate, do you have anything to add on that one? No, I think that pretty much captures it. We, um, I think the, you know, Patrick's comment in terms of the scale and Mark picked up on this as well. I think that's, that would be true of our shoreline as well. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, where do we draw the line of buffering impacts and getting out of the way? Is $1 billion feasible cost? Where's the line? Well, that is the question. That, that's the question that every municipality is struggling with. How much of their tax dollars, if they have a contribution to this, and it may not be a, even a large contribution, but for a municipality, it may be way more than they can do. Um, and even with the landowners themselves, how much money is out there to solve the problem? So um, the, the line is a line that has not been defined yet. And it's very difficult, particularly when we don't have the resources going to, and, and, and really it's about individual and private landowners that, that are feeling the brunt of this. Um, we don't, we really don't have programs for those people to help them out of these situations. And until those programs show up, then there is no real line to draw. Yeah, yeah and I, I, oh, yes, Patrick. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree with, with Mark there. And, and we just did just some of our more recent efforts, but just did a vulnerability assessment. And so, uh, in short, within those shoreline hazards, we have three quarters of a billion dollars. And so, on the one hand, it's just a staggering amount to to move in terms of the value of, of structures within that shoreline hazard. But much more than that, they would all need a place to go in order to really accommodate the get out of the way strategy and, and that it just doesn't exist right now. Uh, Kate. Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to echo Mark and, and Patrick's comments. Um, I did mention that the bulk of our shoreline is fully hardened and engineered. Um, so for better or worse, we're not as susceptible to erosion per se. That's not necessarily a good thing. It has this whole spin-off effect, as I mentioned, including sediment deprivation. But the costs of repairing our shoreline are uh, are astronomical. And the Jim Tovey project alone is it runs in the 50 million. Uh, and that's just one breach. So it's it's very expensive. And this is also where we, we, we've, we had this unique opportunity with this funding sort of partnership with the, with the region of Peel that because otherwise there's, there's just no way we'd be able to come up with that sort of funding. And, and, and do you know off the top of your head, Kate, what the breakdown is of where the funding came from? It's fully funded by Peel Region through, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a funding formula that has to do, we're working with their infrastructure group. So uh, it has to do with um, cost recoveries from not having, from essentially local reuse of that fill material that's generated as part of infrastructure development. Um, so they haven't recovered the full costs, but they've recovered a lot of it. And uh, these are the types of uh, partnerships that we're having to look at because mainstream sort of funding, it, it just won't even come close to, to the cost of these projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so one here, you've all done a great job of describing your local situation. I'd like to hear from each of you as to what's the one issue keeping you up at night as you try to navigate your communities to successful adaptation to coastal hazards. Uh, Kate, maybe we'll start with you. Sorry. Um, so, uh, well, we've, we've got a, a most, as I mentioned, a mostly developed hardened shoreline. Um, I don't think we, we have any areas or it's, it's an unusual situation. So we don't have, obvious areas or structures that are, are at immediate risk or catastrophic failure in the way that the other CAs do. Um, so I would say, and this sounds a bit trite, but we're probably not being kept up at night. We've got more time, I would say. 
Thank you for that. And Patrick. Um, I, I, I don't think that's trade of allocate. I think it's a wonderful position to be in. Um, we do have a few more uh, catastrophic type failures that, that we are expecting, but um, honestly, the thing that keeps me up at night is just how much is already within those hazards. It, you could develop the best planning strategies in the world and get everybody like, you know, out of any of these hazards for a 200 or 300 year horizon, but it doesn't do anything for the hundreds and hundreds of people that are already in there and all those buildings. And it's just such a large task to try to pivot something that's already there. Yeah, that 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 legacy development is uh, is huge on our Great Lakes shorelines for sure. Uh, Mark, I, I think what keeps me up is that we are not where we need to be with nature-based solutions on our lakes. Um, we are still implementing solutions that will actually, in the long run, create more problems, add to this legacy of problems that we have. Um, we need somehow to get the whole lake management to a nature-based place so that not only large projects, but even individuals somehow fit into that. And we're nowhere near that. And, and we need to get there. I don't know. There's, there's ideas about um, lit, uh, littoral cell committees and resiliency work that the federal government is doing. I see that as a glimmer of hope, but right, we're not there on the ground with people and with municipalities to get to the point of implementing nature-based solutions everywhere. Yeah. Well said. Um, uh, can the panelists share who has been the most surprising or most beneficial champion of their initiatives to communicate with the public? And why, how have they been most surprising or most beneficial? So uh, maybe we'll start with Patrick. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, I might have a two-part answer here. One is, is it is some of the cottage communities and, and the people whom, whom we're telling, you know, you have even less time than you imagined and you're much more at risk than you imagined are, are still getting out there and on their own time trying to get their neighbors in and have meetings and then have us speak to them. Um, the other thing that I, I find actually more genuinely surprising perhaps is is the representation from real estate and the number of realtors and, and representatives of real estate associations we've had to some of our public information centers and their interest in it because I, I complain constantly about the number of shoreline buyers reports we issue versus the number of real estate signs I see on the end of 21 and there's just dozens of people every weekend seemingly rolling over these cottage properties these shoreline properties um who have not spoken to the ca who very likely don't have any conception of, of the gravity of the hazards on the shoreline uh, so the engagement of real estate has been really uh, pleasing and surprising yeah um uh, mark um i would say a number of local committees and individuals i'm um, forever trying to let people know we need to be evolutionary, not revolutionary, but there are no old, little old ladies in the Erie Oak Community Association, I'll tell you that. And uh, when I go talk with them to uh, politicians, MPPs and MPs and municipal politicians, I'm forever saying, if you want from, something from these people, you've got to treat them well. But they have no patience for not having action happen. And I am continually reassured by these community members that want, that want to move things forward and are willing to listen to progressive ideas of moving them forward. So um, it, it's really all about individual community members that are making, that are becoming champions for pro, these projects uh, in Lake Erie. Thanks, and finally, Kate. Yeah, well, I'll definitely echo Mark's comments in terms of, of, of the value of an engaged community. We've had the same experience along our shoreline and more specifically with the Jim Tovey project. And 
There have been a lot of interest groups involved from the get-go. Uh, definitely the, the Mississaugas of Credit First Nation in particular took an active interest in the project and provided some very valuable feedback, which is being fully incorporated into the um, public realm design phase of the project, which we're moving into now. And so that's been an interesting process. One, uh, I guess, interesting anecdote was uh, we had a, one particularly vocal opponent to the Jim Tovey project. Um, and that individual made a point of stating that we had completed insufficient outreach and gave a couple of examples of things that we ought to be doing, including uh, in-person presence at surrounding parks. And we actually took that suggestion and, and ran with it for several years, uh, carrying out uh, sessions in, in three different parks and over weekends, weekdays, and, and it turned out to be a very, very effective way of engaging with members of the community. And we've actually carried it forward to other projects. So it's just one of those situations where it, it came in seemingly as a negative and turned out to be a very positive um, input, feedback. That's great, because you were willing to listen, right? Um, and oh, next question, what is being done to prevent more development from being directed to the shoreline within the shoreline hazard area? Um, we'll start with Mark. Well, within our area, basically um, within the hazards that are the extreme hazards, the municipality and the conservation authority have enacted policies that basically freeze development. So there's very little development going on because everything being developed is within a, a, an extreme hazard area and much of our shoreline. Um, and um, to the extent that whole roadways are being abandoned. So um, it, it, we're probably an extreme example of, of having very, very tight policy that is like, we are even limited. There, there's no expansions of houses. There's very, very limited development allowed uh, along our high hazard areas of shoreline. Okay, and uh, Patrick. Um, similar, although I don't think uh, as as stringent as as Mark's been able to get in his neck of the woods. But we do certainly have um, limitations on on the types of new developments and new lot creation and things like that. Um, on the for us, the west side of the hundred year erosion hazard, but. Um, there's been a lot of questions raised lately in, in our watershed about whether that's even sufficient. Um, you know, your, your clock sort of starts ticking day one, you lay out this plan of subdivision have, okay, here's the hundred year erosion hazard, you know, 15 years later, when that subdivision is, is approved, you've eaten through a good chunk of your time already in, in that hundred year horizon. So, uh, we do have that tool to sort of keep uh, newer, larger development out, but um, I don't even know if that's sufficient, to be honest. Thank you for your honesty. Um, Kate, this may not be a fair question for Kate. She's not in the uh, hazards program, but give it, a, give it a try, Kate. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I mentioned that we've made recent updates to our shoreline hazard guidelines. Um, we are still dependent on the provincial guidelines for direction. So we're really waiting for updates to that and we'll, we'll adopt as needed. Okay, and um, what do you think is the most critical gap on your coastline with regard to adaptation to coastal hazards? We'll start with, I can't remember whose turn it is. Let's say Kate. <laughs> They're not gonna appreciate this, but Jacob, I might ask you to wait in on responding to this question. If he's still there. And that's maybe something that he can put into the uh, the, the, the Q and A. I think, I think he's able to speak. He's oh, got, he is. yeah. Oh, that's why we have uh, Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hi. hear okay, you. Okay, good. Um, I think, I mean, I think our, our question for us, um, especially if we're talking about shorelines, is, is similar to what Kate's answer was for, for, for the last one. So we've done some updates and we've done some 
peer review work on on some of our hazard management around the shorelines, but really there's been discussions um, around any updates or, or what the province expects us to do. Uh, I think that's the the part that's missing for us to, to have good direction from the province. I know there's uh, some some work being done in the background. Uh, there's a you know going to be a presentation tomorrow actually on the shoreline group about uh, potentially updates to the guidelines from the province. We're curious what what that is and what that looks like and and how that's going to take us into the future with with changes that we need to make. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, Patrick. I too am wildly excited about those updates and um, I think I have a pretty good idea about some of what's going to be in them. So I, I think it is, <laughs> I really want to see that m &R update <laughs> any day now it would be great. Um, but even with that, I think the biggest gap is, um, is really any kind of program or incentive or anything to help people relocate even where there's a number of folks who may be willing um, to to pick up and move their their building their house their cottage uh, it's incredibly expensive there's no one there to help them really and again there's not necessarily a place to go not some like retreat zone or something in the in the bylaw um, it's a big huge gap that leaves um, people either in a very you know they have lots of resources and want to be proactive or have enough resources and are really desperate but outside those two situations there's nothing to help that relocation yeah absolutely um mark um i agree i agree with patrick um we need to probably be buying as conservation authorities and municipalities buying out um, people that live on those worst parts of our shoreline. There are really no solutions for for a number of people. And basically it's not a it's not a retreat. There's nowhere for them to go. Um, we need to have programs where we can basically go in and remove those those people from that hazard. And at, at one time we had those programs. There are a number of municipalities, the parklands down the rivers in, in the communities are because of old programs of buying people out that were in floodplains. We need and to do the same thing on the lake. Maybe Mark, if you can uh, clarify who, who funded those programs. That was funded by the province, the municipality and the, um, uh, and the federal government with the municipality usually coming in around 10% and the rest being shared by the federal and provincial governments. We need the provincial government back at the table with regards to funding. And we do need to, there, there are people that there is no solution for, and we've got to somehow address that, that need. Thank you all for that. Um, and we've got another question here. Can anyone comment on how shoreline development is being controlled where there are no conservation authorities? Probably not on this panel. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, a really good question. Kate, is that that would be a shrug, right? Yeah, I I, I could say it's a good question. <laughs> um yes, I I believe it would be with in the in the municipal, in the provincial policy statement. So it would be municipalities. Um, shoreline municipalities, and then we have unorganized territories, right? Um, typically what we say is um, where it's natural hazards is the mandate for Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. And so they would, you know, the province would have a hand in it, but um, I'm pretty sure they would point to the provincial policy statement, but um, I actually don't know that off the top of my head either, the answer to that question. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yep, it looks like, oh, another question here. Uh, currently of cottages, houses are deemed unsafe or lost. Will the property owner simply lose that property? Right now, in the absence of, of these uh, programs, 
Houses are deemed unsafe or lost. So if it's deemed unsafe, then the people can't live in it. Um, Mark. So uh, in our watershed, um, the municipality is responsible to determine whether the house, it would be the building official that would go in and determine if it's unsafe. At that point, if that house is removed because of the hazard and not because of fire or anything else, then our policies would prohibit them from replacing that house and they would the land would then not be developed from that perspective, unless there was somewhere on that property. But I'm talking about most properties where there isn't somewhere outside of the hazard. And and so the extension that will the property owner simply lose that property? So the, prop the property in owner still owns the property, but they lose the ability to develop it with with house or whatever. Or 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 to live on it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they can set up a lawn chair. Hmm. Is that okay? Um, Patrick, anything to add to that? Uh I don't think so. I don't know of any examples in, in our watershed. I mean, in order to properly lose the property, um, I think they basically have to walk away from it and cease paying taxes for a number of years. And eventually, I think it goes to the municipality, but that um, takes quite a long process. And they it's it's not really being taken from them. They have to sort of walk away from it, is my understanding. Hmm. Uh, Kate or anyone from your team, if they have anything to add to that? I don't think Jacob. you do. No, I don't. Jacob, do sure. you yeah, it's fine. Our policies are, are very similar in a sense that if if a structure is lost because of the hazard, it can't be replaced for for the in the same location. And and you know, we'd look opportunities for a property if there's anywhere else on the property that has less risk potentially that you can reconstruct. Uh, typically that's mostly to do with erosion hazards. Um I don't have an example. I don't think we have any properties where that's occurred already, um, where there was nowhere else on the property that you could you could potentially build something. Um, obviously, like Kate mentioned, our, our shoreline is is hardened quite a bit, so we obviously have policies that allow people to provide shoreline protection uh, to help reduce those erosion hazards. So, I mean, we we definitely have that. Um, I can't think of a, any example top of the head that we have any properties that are went through that process where someone had a dwelling and then. It was either destroyed by the hazard or uh, deemed unsafe by a building authority or someone that that didn't allow for for it to remain. But it's it's certainly a risk, and it's it's written into a policy like that as well. Okay, thank you. We do have we do have some uh, properties where people um, don't have the right to either rebuild or build on those properties, and are still being assessed uh, residential tax rates on those properties and are having a very difficult time getting that assessment brought down. Um, and uh, a number of those people are contemplating ceasing to pay taxes and therefore moving to a position where they're, they're seized by the municipality. But it's because of the tax rates they're paying. They would like to keep the properties, but they're not interested in paying residential rates for properties that can't have residential development. Yeah, and residential rates for a waterfront as well, right? Yeah, very expensive taxes. Yes. Um, thank you, Mark. And the uh, last question that we have up here is, uh, how are the approaches you are taking and the lessons you are learning being shared and built upon in other areas that are equally as vulnerable but may not have the same capacity or awareness? And I, I think in part the answer to this is, this webinar is one example, <laughs> but um, uh, does anyone want to take on that question? Um, Kate, uh, I think maybe we'll open it up to you. You did a little bit of a promo of a group that you're involved with. Yeah, so that's obviously specific to, uh, it's a community of practice that came out of an interest that goes back to 2016 uh, through Coastal Zone Canada. Anyway, I would encourage people to look at the Coastal Zone Canada website and look at the their four community of practices uh, across the, the, the country, country, including the Great Lakes. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, as far as additional work that's being done and sharing lessons learned, one thing that's um, that's also in play right now is something called the Land to Lake Initiative, which is now uh, recognized as a priority in the Canada-Ontario Agreement for Great Lakes. And 
it's looking at, it's now being led by Environment Canada with support by uh, MECP and uh, TRCA and Credit Valley Conservation also play a supporting role, but it's essentially looking at the interest in better collaboration from essentially Niagara over to Coburg. And it is taking sort of a watershed based approach and sort of what, what happens on the land affects the lake. And uh, part of the, the objectives of that initiative is to share expertise with um, the smaller CAs and also municipalities. Um, so everything from low impact development training, but currently we're, 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 we're going to be launching a, a training initiative focused on natural asset management. Uh, so that's another example of something um, that tries to get at that comment of, of capacity. And I think CAs generally are very good at trying to share expertise with other CAs, but also with our municipal partners. And, and uh, you know, maybe I would add to it that, you know, Conservation Ontario is uh, um, uh, committed to pushing this whole agenda forward around the coastal projects and, and initiatives um, and to help build capacity across the Conservation Authority network. So, um, uh, yeah, it is, uh, it's recognized it's really important to share um, the, the practices and to continue to build the knowledge and, uh, um, and, and capacity across the conservation authorities for, for coastal management. Um, I'm, look, does anyone else want to comment on that, that question? Uh, I would comment in that I think the shoreline management plans have been very important. Uh, the processes that our municipalities um, have, uh, the most recent being Chatham-Kent, have engaged thousands of citizens in the shoreline issues. And what has come out mm -hmm. of those shoreline management plans is a series of environmental assessments and other types of works whereby the municipality is desperately trying to solve very, very big problems. And um, those, uh, and it's because we are at that situation, that state with our shoreline. But it's those processes where we're engaging with the public through municipally led initiatives that we're having discussions about nature-based solutions and, and coming up with something that's more resilient in the long term. So um, for us, it's different because we're probably in a different situation where we have some big problems to solve, um, but it, it's through uh, engagement uh, in, uh, with, the uh, with the community in coming up with solutions. Yeah, and, and maybe I would add to that, Mark, and it's, it's, the com it's not just the, uh, the shoreline landowners in the community, it's the watershed community and everybody who would be, um, you know, part of the tax base for paying for solutions as well. Like, I, you know, I, I believe that is uh, an important component of, of, of the dialogue. Um, Absolutely. Um, if you don't have the rest of the community involved, you can't get to the point of a solution. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to mention two things and, and really just that we're fortunate to be able to, um, you know, digest, chat about and, and pass a lot of this stuff through the um, uh, Coastal Resilience Think Tank led by Environment and Climate Change Canada. And lots of us have spoken in that venue before about these projects. Um, and also uh, the, the shoreline hazard update that I, I presented about where lucky enough to sort of be a dry run for um, doing an update like that and incorporating climate change into the mapping and that informed the development of, of those tech guides that I hope we all see very soon so hopefully that uh, that knowledge can be passed through to everybody in the form of, of those new tech guides. And that reminds me Patrick of uh, the Conservation Authority Coastal Working Group which is a a, a conservation authority organized discussion group that's been together for s several years, um, meeting twice a year to share uh, their experiences and, um, and and activities as well. So, um, so lots lots to build upon and improve so that uh, we can get some focused solutions to some 
really big problems that have been shared today. So um, I don't see any further questions. And um, so I, I think we will call it there. Uh, I want to thank the participants for uh, the questions that you've raised. Uh, they generated uh, some great discussion, I think, across the panelists. And I want to take another moment to thank all of the panelists for giving us their time, for sharing their experiences, and for their continued leadership in navigating adaptation to coastal hazards. Uh, I would also like to thank the Laternal Symposium Steering Committee for selecting this webinar topic and Don Goodyear from Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority for leading us uh, to its successful completion. I'm going to turn it over to Don now for further acknowledgements and messages from the Laternal Committee to, uh, to wrap things up. Uh, great, thanks Bonnie. Just uh, wanna echo uh, your thanks to the, uh, to the speakers. Uh, I think we've all learned uh, something today. Uh, really, really great talks. Uh, so this webinar has been brought to you by the Laternal Symposium Steering Committee, and I'd like to thank uh, those involved who helped make it happen, including uh, Jamie Jutri, who you um, saw in the chat earlier on. She had to leave a little bit earlier, but she's the Symposium Program Chair uh, and keeping us all on track. Uh, April Wepler from uh, CELA uh, helped uh, organize this event along with Nakisha Mohammed from Conservation Ontario and Mario Millet and uh, Karen Anderson from Allset. Uh, all uh, helpful in planning this, uh, this successful webinar. Uh, this session and forthcoming webinars will be recorded as I think was, was noted in, in some of the housekeeping slides. Um, this one should be posted in a few days, so check back to the Laternal website. Uh, the symposium itself is happening on October 23rd and 24th at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington. Uh, unfortunately, it is sold out, uh, but hopefully many of you were able to uh, register before that uh, uh, that sellout happened and, and look forward to bumping into some of you there. Uh, the next webinar will be on November 21st uh, and keeping with a, a shoreline theme is called Building Re Resilient Shorelands, How to Take Positive Land Use Action in a Changing Environmental and Legislative Climate. Uh, registration for that uh, webinar will happen in October, so stay tuned uh, for more info on that one. And one last thing, just before everyone leaves, um, really interested in, in feedback and how we can make uh, this webinar series um, uh, better as we go, so please uh, complete our short poll. Thanks very much everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.